I don't ever say anything about it, but if you want to, if you want to hear Seth sing that song about 30 years ago, <laughs> just go to spbiblechurch.com. <laughs> if you go to the music, there's all the singing we had, the CDs we made and everything way back then. And uh, kind of interesting. Yeah, I remember when we recorded that song and how what trouble we had because Seth's voice was changing and we'd get almost done and he'd squeak on us and then we'd have to do the whole thing over again. And it was a hard deal, but I'm a, I don't I'm not very good at promoting stuff. I don't remember to say things, and a lot of people don't know about all that stuff and. Uh, some of Kenny's family here, when he was here, wanted that song. They wanted the words and music of that song. And I just sent him a link to that page on the website, and he sent it to him. That's what they wanted. That's what they needed. And I don't remember to put up pictures of, of the progress going on with the building out here either. I haven't. <laughs> uh, well, Mike's taking a lot of pictures too. and. I just need some once in a while. I don't take pictures when I'm out there. That's <laughs> I'm too occupied. But uh, somebody send me a picture here. You know, just send me a few pictures of the progress, and we'll put them up where everybody can see them. Because people want to know. You know, they wonder what's going on. Y'all is not doing anything. Well, almost. <laughs> we are doing something. All right, John chapter 1. You all know where we're going, don't you? This has really been helpful to me in the rest of the Word of God. We've been reading in Corinthians, our reading, and and it's just everywhere. You see the same things, Paul echoing the same things. And Anyway, let's go to John chapter 1. Let's start reading in verse 15. Let's read 15 through 17 this morning. John bear witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. And he, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John bear witness of Jesus. And, and cried, saying... Now, that's not all John said. There's a whole lot more that John said. But what we want to talk about this morning is the witness. The cry and the witness. John, bear witness of Him. And let's, let's pray. Father, thank You for the service this far. Thank You for the good Word of God and the songs. And thank You, Lord, for each one that's here. And a good spirit among us, please bless and help your word to have free course in our hearts and minds this morning. Please help us to hear and understand the message, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Part of the law of God is the truth that, that truth is established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. There has to be a witness. If you go back in the law in Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 6 and on there, it talks about that. Uh, you can't put a man or a person to death in the mouth of one witness. Just because one person says, i seen him do this, you can't put him to death. The witness is very important. And there has to be at least two that bear witness for a thing to be considered true. And if someone is found to be being a false witness, they are to get what they were trying to do to this person. I mean, if they were trying to get him hung, you hang them. The Bible says that very plainly in Deuteronomy. John was the first witness. Why Why didn't Jesus just appear then? Why didn't he just appear one day and said, Here I am. I'm announcing myself. I've come to the world. I'm God's Son. He sent me. No, it had to be a witness. You can't testify about yourself. Men don't take that word. But Jesus had to have a witness come before. It's prophesied in the Old Testament that I'll send my messenger before. 
I mean, he will come in the spirit of Elijah, and there he'll be. You'll, he'll come first. There'll be a forerunner. There'll be a voice before he comes. And just throw this in there, beware, because the devil is an imitator. He imitates everything God does, and that's just how it's going to be in, in the last days here with the false prophet and the beast. There's going to be a false prophet announcing him. Beware. John was the first witness. And God himself was the other as he spoke from heaven that day. And said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3 and verse 17. There were others who could have been a witness. But God made John some kind of a special witness. Matthew and Mark and Luke all recorded that, that voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. To, to bear witness is to affirm the truth about a matter. There's a lot of talk, always has been, among independent Baptists I've been around, about being a witness. But I'm gonna, we're going to just look at that this morning and just see what a witness really is. How do you bear witness a witness has to be believable. Just because I say something, or just because you say something, just because anybody says something, don't mean that it's true. And it don't make it believable either. It's just like he's talking about all the noise, and the rattling, and the voices, and all of that in the world. But, man, I don't believe hardly anything anymore. I don't believe anything anybody tells me unless I can confirm it some other way because a witness just doesn't carry much weight in a generation of lies like we're living in John knew that Jesus was the son of God first thing a witness has to be is he has to know for sure that what he is saying is true he has to know it he can't just be thinking it he can't just be repeating what somebody else told him he has to know himself that it is true now, John knew, and that's what made him a, a witness. How did he know? How did he know before Peter and James and John and all the rest of them knew? How did he know? So surely, how was he so fixed and so able and empowered as a witness of Christ? Even after the crucifixion and the resurrection and all the ministry of Christ on earth was finished there, he said, tarry ye here in the, in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Well, there's your answer right there. John was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. You remember at the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. He knew then. Say, so explain that to me now. I don't know how to explain that to you. Who can explain in carnal terms, the things of God. That's what the Word of God says, and I believe it. John was made and created by God for this purpose. He, he was born for this moment, this ministry of His, to bear witness that He is the Son of God. He is the Christ. He's the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God. And He could say it, and and it was believable. Mm -hmm. It didn't require a bunch of uh, education. It didn't require anything. Everybody understood it. All the region round about went out to hear John in the wilderness. I wonder who was there at his first message. I wonder who was there the first time he preached. Did they run through Jerusalem and announce in the streets, there's a man going to preach way out there in the wilderness. Won't everybody come out and hear him? It wasn't a time when they were really interested in preaching. Nobody had heard any for a long, long time. Nobody had heard anybody cry with a message for a long time. I don't know who was there the first time he said anything, but whoever, if it was one person, two persons, they went and got the rest of them and said, you better come out here and listen to this. This is different than what you're hearing, where you're at. This is different than what we've ever heard. I mean, it sounded like, you know, nonsense. 
He's here. He's arrived. <laughs> so a witness has to be believable. And John cried, saying, that's what the verse says. John bare witness of him and cried, saying. John didn't read a script. John didn't have notes. <laughs> I'm not I'm preaching with some notes, so but the, that, that, I'm not John the Baptist. John didn't he didn't wax eloquent. He didn't put on a drama for the crowd. No, the only thing he did was bear witness of what this man who this man was. They didn't walk away from John the Baptist saying, Man, that's good preaching. They didn't walk away from John the Baptist uh, saying, man, what a service we had. It wasn't loud roaring or some kind of sensationalism. No, John the Baptist bore witness of him. Very simple, short sentence there, but I mean, it's full of truth. And it's good for us to hear in our and to apply in our practice also to bear witness. Well, what does that word mean? If you look at your Bible, it says B-A-R-E, not B-E-A-R. Now, we know what that is. You better be scared of them things. But bear, B-A-R-E. Well, I read the definition out of the dictionary, but I, I'm holding back on some of it because it wouldn't be proper to say from where I'm standing. Bear in the 1828 dictionary means what you think it means. It doesn't mean to carry. That's not what that word means. That he bear witness. He didn't carry anything. Plain, simple, unadorned, without the polish of refined manners. John the Baptist. He was clothed in a in camel's hair, girt about the leather girdle, girdle, and uh, girt about the loins with a leathern girdle. Yeah, that's right. He ate grasshoppers and stuff like that. Wild honey. The wild honey don't sound too bad, but them grasshoppers is none. Uh. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine grasshopper legs and his whiskers and everything? Ew, ew. Plain. He bore, he bare witness. See, I'm changing the word there. You didn't do that. Bear witness. That's the preterite of, of, of the... Now, well, it's an, this is an adjective. The verb is to strip off the covering. Plain, simple, unadorned, without the polish of refined manners, laid open to view, detected, no longer concealed. And it also means poor, destitute, in, uh, in, indigent, wow, empty and unfurnished. You get the, you get the meaning of the word. And, and why it's used here and how it applies here. John, in other words, we say it like this. He preached it just like it was. He didn't hold anything back. And he made it plain and simple. He said, make straight the way of the Lord. Don't make it crooked. Don't make it muddy. He said the axe. Well, let's just go back there and Luke here. Here's what he said. Annas and Kev has been the high priest. The word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Now, well, you know what we were talking about, don't you? Elizabeth knew. Zacharias knew. They probably told John. John had this in him all of his life. But when the word of the Lord came to John, that revealed to John who he was. In a way that his mother and his father did not know. They knew the facts, but they didn't know it like John knew it. I mean, God put the fire in John's soul. No wonder. The Word of God. That's what this chapter is. He's the Word, see? And when God speaks and, and conveys His thoughts, His, His soul to you, well, it's no wonder Jeremiah said, you know, the Word was in me like a fire in my bones and I could not stay. Jeremiah said, I'm quitting. 
if this is the way it's going to be, and they won't listen, and this is all I get, I'm done. But he said, I couldn't be done. The Word of God was in me, and I had to, I had to cry it. Big difference. Yeah. Just knowing a fact. Yeah. Knowing a set of, of guidelines or truths or knowing truth as just a matter of fact. Yeah. It's a different when it's the Word of God in you. The Word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. He wasn't in downtown Jerusalem. And he wasn't anywhere where all the people were. He was away from everybody else. Away from all the other influences. He wasn't listening all the time to what the world was saying. So he heard God after 400 years of silence. This is the first time the Word of God has come to a man like that in centuries. It was dark. It was dead. Religion, yeah. But life, no. John's talking about life here. Light here. This is something they're not familiar with. This generation here is not familiar with that. And he, he came into all the country round about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. <laughs> as it is written in the book of the words, uh, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear witness. You see, he's holding nothing back. I mean, he's telling them just like it is. Without any, uh, you know, fancy... Uh, carefulness and etiquette and manners and all of that. He's just telling them the Word of God is in him for this generation. Jesus has come! Christmas has already happened 30 years before this, if you want to call it that. Then said he to the multitude that come for, O generation of the morning, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance and begin not to say within yourselves we have Abraham to our father for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham you see now and now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees every tree that bring, therefore bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire that's how John the Baptist preached that's why everybody went out to the wilderness to hear him because it was different. Jesus preached like that do y'all know that Yes, he did. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? And he answered and said to them, blah, blah, blah. And, then, and the soldiers came to him. The publicans came to him. All in that chapter there. It's chapter 3 three of Luke. Yeah, chapter 3 of Luke. So that's how he preached. Plain, simple, unadorned, without the polish of refined manners. He didn't sit and read them his sermon. He didn't teach them a lesson. He didn't talk like a college professor or a woman. He spoke with authority. He cried with authority. To bear witness, there must be a cry in the voice of the witness. Are you listening to me? It can't just be cold, dry stating of the facts. Now we... You know, there's a place for teaching in the church. There's a place for teaching in the home, in our life. Teaching, teaching. That's one thing. We're not talking about teaching. We're talking here about being a witness. To bear witness. Do we bear witness for the Lord? Do we do what John the Baptist did, who was the first witness of the Lord? Jesus said, He that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than him. There's none born of women, greater born of, of women than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Well, wow. I don't know. 
Seems to me like we might be falling short here. It can't just be cold, dry statement of facts. You're not being a witness if all you got's the Roman road. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. There's got to be a cry in that voice. Yes. I know what I'm saying. That's right. I've the times that I've heard preaching in my life since I've been a Christian, I can tell you the ones where there was a cry. Yes, sir. Yes. I remember. Because it was a difference. It was the attention getter. Yes. It arrested your soul. You didn't go to sleep. You didn't get bored. You didn't forget about it as soon as you walked out the door. Right. It was something that reached through. The voice of that witness made you think about God and Christ. Being a witness in a public setting requires more than a, a chirp or a whine or a falsetto voice. There's got to be enough volume for it to be heard by everyone. John's in public. We're talking about here the public witness. John preached. He wasn't door-to-door -door visiting people. There's a lot of difference. Now, the cry ought to be in your voice if you're talking to somebody one-on-one -on -one, as well as it is from the pulpit of a church somewhere or out on a street corner preaching to people. But I found that out preaching on the street too. Is If that cry ain't in your voice, they'll mock and make fun of you. Mm -hmm. If the cry is in your voice, it stops them. Mm -hmm. It really does. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they are hushed. And their attention is on you, listening to what you're saying. That's the difference. John bare witness and cried. I don't mean wept, although he probably did. Crying like that may include weeping, but it's but we say to the children, Why are you crying? Well, they're weeping, they're not crying. Sometimes they cry. Ah! You know, but that's just to, that's just for your benefit, really. <laughs> it, it's got to be more than just the transfer or confirmation of facts and knowledge. A witness is more than that. A witness for Christ has to be more than that. We can't just tell people about Jesus. There has to be something more in our voice. There has to be something more in our soul. There has to be something more transferred in the process than just words of facts that we know. There's got to be passion. There's got to be conviction of the truth that's being testified to. Now you reckon John had that? Did John preach? Did he speak with passion? Absolutely he did. Because he cried. That means he spoke it with passion and with volume and with and 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 reality in him. There was more than just John a talking. Not John a imparting his intellectual meanderings. There's got to be passion. John was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. The blind men who came to Jesus. If you read your Bible, you'll find they cried. They, he, old blind Bartimaeus, he cried out, the more cried out. No wonder Jesus stopped. If he had just stood there with his thumb up like that, you reckon Jesus might have passed him by? He cried out with passion, with feeling, because your your mouth, if your heart is in it, your it's gonna come out your mouth. Now the bun's heart, the mouth speaking. You can't have love and compassion and and conviction in your heart and not speak it with a with a cry. Jesus cried when he preached. Read the parable of the sower in Luke, I believe it is, in Luke chapter thirteen, eight. And uh, he cried. They asked him and he, uh, what it meant, and he cried when he told them what it meant. We miss that, see? We read it, and it's, yeah, it's parable of the sower, you know, the rocky. We always look at the by the wayside, on the stony ground, among thorns, and, and then on the good ground, and that's where we focus on. But 
Man, there was some passion in that because that was such an important parable. And so much truth imparted and so much clarity about the kingdom of God and getting in it and the seed, which is the Word, and how it all works. And, and Jesus didn't just tell them a story like the three bears and send them to bed. He didn't wait for the applause when he got done because that was such a fine exhortation, such a fine, eloquent story that he told. No, it was with passion. He cried. <laughs> when he called Lazarus from the tomb, does it say he called Lazarus? He said to Lazarus, no, he cried. Lazarus, come forth. That's a little more than just speaking. That's a little more than just commanding. He cried. <laughs> Nobody can laugh when somebody's crying. That's being a witness. That's how we shut the mouths of the gainsayers. Have something more in you than just a head full of knowledge and a heart as cold as ice. There has to be some feeling in with this. You can live your life without it and be miserable. But when it comes to being a witness for God, you can't be a witness without it. There has to be some of it, some of it there. You know that's right. You know that's right. If you got any experience at all in witnessing to people, you know that you don't get anywhere in the coldness of the letter. You get to them when you... When it begins to come from a place and, a, and being anointed with the Spirit of God. John was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. When, he called, when Jesus called Lazarus from the tomb, he cried. The, when he was on the cross, the last utterance that he did, did he just speak a word? No, no he cried. It is finished. And everybody heard him. And some of the Roman soldiers standing by said, Surely this was the Son of God. His cry was enough to convince a Roman soldier that had been standing there participating in his murder. Where's our cry? The cry is focused and intense. The rich man in hell said to Father Abraham, no, it's not, no, no. No, he cried, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Didn't he? Anytime there's some passionate plea, it's a cry. It's not just a, an, a sales pitch. Right. It's not a a try, uh, uh, an intellectual reasoning, a battle of the reason trying to convince somebody that, that they need to believe what you're telling them. And if they'll just believe these facts, that then they can be saved that way and go to heaven when they die. If you look in the book of Revelation, I'm not going there, but I'm just going to tell you in three different places that I can see real clearly the angels cried with their announcements during the tribulation and the wrath of God on this world, the angels stood on the and cried with a loud voice to the inhabitants of the world. The cry and the witness makes it believable because it's obviously coming from something besides the selfishness and intellect of the witness. That is why all the region round about went out to the wilderness to hear John. What was the draw? Was he giving away bicycles? <laughs> uh, gift cards? <laughs> Money? Was he rewarding people with things like that? Was that the draw? No, 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 no. No, there was something there that people wanted to hear. And people have never stopped wanting to hear that. It's just that the church so fumbles the ball and we as Christians so fumble the ball with our cold-hearted efforts at trying to promote the kingdom of God. We represent Christ here with our 
dead words and our cold hearts and our proud intellects and lost people continue to drop off into hell. They just hear a little passion. If they just hear a little cry in our voice, if they see it in us, if they a cry means that you care and you believe what you're saying. How'd John already know what he was bearing witness to? It wasn't revealed to him by flesh and blood, but by the Spirit of God. That's what we read there in, in Luke chapter 3 a while ago about the word of the Lord came unto John in the wilderness. John had been raised by Zacharias and Elizabeth. You remember the story there in Luke. Hmm. Old and well stricken in age and past the time of all the childbearing and all of that. Zacharias said to the angel, how shall this be? I mean, seeing that I'm an old man and my wife is... I remember somebody else saying that Abraham said the same thing. Yes. And uh, our kids have always, our younger kids have always talked about that. that what did you, how'd you put it? Having elderly parents or... Late life children. Late life children, yeah. And how, you know, late life children are deprived so much because their parents are old and don't want to go nowhere and don't want to do stuff. and so that. But John the Baptist was a late life child. And so was Isaac. And there were others also. Joseph. And uh, think about it. That was a good thing John the Baptist was a late life child. Good thing that he wasn't exposed to everything else in the world. God prepared the messenger to announce the coming of the Lord, the Savior of the world. <laughs> With late life, yeah, you know, as a late life child. He gave him to old people to raise. Zacharias was a priest. Well, that was just a little extra there. John, John didn't, he, like I said a while ago, without a doubt, he had, he had heard and he knew what they said and what they told him. But you know how it is. I mean, the stuff that your grandpa tells you and your, mom, your dad tells you and your great-grandpa tells you and the stuff you know about all that, well, it's kind of like stories in a book, isn't it? You weren't there. You didn't experience it. You didn't hear it. John leaped in his mother's womb at the salutation of Mary, but... He didn't remember that. How many of you remember being in your mother's womb before you was born? No, nobody does. <laughs> uh, anyway, John learned it from God. That's how John learned it. That's how John knew it. What I know about God right now, it's because God revealed it to my soul. I first heard of it through a witness who cried. Got my attention. Got me to thinking. Got me to searching. Got me to praying and looking for and seeking for God. But then when God revealed Himself to me, that changed everything. Changed my world completely. Changed my soul. Amen. Being Christ, He's a new creature. When you get born again, it's because God has bore witness to your soul, your spirit, that you're the child of God. And that's what happened to John here. John knew. He knew. He knew before Peter did. He knew before any of the disciples, anybody else in the world. John knew. Now that's amazing to me. That's a thought to ponder right there. John. John knew. That's why Jesus said among those born of women, there's hath been none greater than John the Baptist. Because he was a special, different kind of person. Prepared of God. And God revealed this to him. Through his spirit. Through his word. Before anybody else knew. And John had to be the first one to say it. To announce it. To proclaim it. Publicly. His witness wouldn't have been with such power if he was only passing along what his mom and daddy told him, what his grandpa told him, what he'd learned since he'd been a little boy. Wouldn't have been the same, would it? 
You don't have that conviction about what your dad tells you, your mama tells you, as you do when, when, when God really tells you. That's why we have so much trouble with the young people jumping ship. They never get close enough to God. And we, and we trust in the fact that if I tell them, they'll believe it. No, they got to hear from God. Or there, it doesn't matter how what we are. doesn't matter how convincing we are. doesn't matter how much work and struggle and time we put into teaching these children and keeping them from evil. They still, it's still got to be God. That confirms it in their soul. Yes, sir. Wasn't revealed to him by flesh and blood. How did he know? There had to be a forerunner who understood this whole matter. I mean, when you read and study, and I've been doing that, not just in John chapter 1, but all the rest of the Gospels and elsewhere. John, what? how much he knew my soul. He knew the whole thing. It's kind of like Abraham did. Abraham talks about things, and if you'll study Abraham and the things he said, man, he understood the millennial. He understood all of the plan of God in the Old Testament, way back there. David, oh my. Now anyway, John the Baptist knew all that. He understood this whole matter, and the whole purpose, his whole purpose for living was to bear witness of the Lamb of God. John was born to stand there that day and say, Behold the Lamb of God. What a moment to realize the moment that you were put here for. For such a time as this. Remember what Mordecai said to Esther? Who knows? But such, for such a time as this, thou art called to the kingdom. Thou art called to the kingdom for such a time as this. There you go. That's how it is. Uh, John was that person. His whole life was for that moment. Let me tell you something this morning. It works the same way still. For others to come to know Jesus, there must be someone to whom God has revealed that knowledge in His very soul. He's heard the gospel and believed on the Lord and the Lord has manifested Himself to His soul. Let me read to you what Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 21. He that hath my commandments, all right, and keepeth them. He it is that loveth me. He that hath my commandments. What do we call the commandments of God? Do we call that the word of God? Yes, we do. The word, the commandments are the word of God. Yes, sir. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. He it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Now Jesus promised that. And that's exactly what we're talking about right here this morning. God has to manifest himself to you in your spirit, in your soul. More than just in your intellect. There's got to be a witness for the Lord who has that cry in His voice before a lost sinner can know who Jesus really is. That's why there's so many sinners who are... There's so few sinners getting saved in our time. That's why, right there. The witness is missing. The witness has been redefined and morphed into this soul winner who goes around... Uh, buttonholing people again the wall and giving them the Romans road and then praying and asking them to agree with it or raise their hand and then that's witnessing. No, that's not witnessing. That's not being a witness for the Lord. Amen. Yep. That's not it. There's no cry. It's been turned into a competition in the churches. A contest. I knew a missionary in Mexico very well who turned out terrible and, and we all found out later he was paying and he's not the only one they're still doing it. Paying the people in the church for every, every paper they bring in so that somebody signs saying they got saved that week. They pay them money for it. That's how they were operating. The church would pay the soul winners so much per soul for everyone they turned in that prayed the sinner's prayer. Yeah. A, that's abominable yes, wickedness. Sir. 
I can't think of anything more wicked in, in my, uh, that I can understand than that. Yeah. Trifling and, and for filthy lucre trafficking in the souls of men. It's worse than the human trafficking that we're always talking about and the child trafficking. It's, it's worse than that. And they call it witnessing. No, it's not witnessing. Witnessing is when you got enough in you with somebody else at least to get somebody else's attention turned toward Christ. See, not toward me. It doesn't turn the attention toward me. It turns it toward Christ. We're going to get to that in a minute before we get done here. But, but John didn't bear witness of himself. John bore witness, bear witness of Christ. Only the Spirit of God in a person can produce that cry. And the Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth also. Remember that. Another major factor in John's witness of Christ was that he put Christ above himself. From the beginning to the end. John chapter 1 verse 15. John bare witness of him and cried saying, This is he, this was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now in verses 19 through 22, the priest and the Levites came and they kept trying to get him to say something about himself. John. But he simply kept pointing them to Christ. Listen. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? Well, now what did they care? Who he is? Because he wasn't telling them nothing about himself. He wasn't preaching about himself. He wasn't telling his life stories and all of his experiences and all of his thoughts and musings. He wasn't preaching about himself. He, who was he preaching about? Christ. Yeah. That's all his message was about. They said, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Nope. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? John didn't want to talk about himself. What is there to know about me? What part have I got in this? This ain't about me. It's about Christ. You go tell them that. That's who I am. I'm the messenger sent from God to tell about Him. He's the one that matters. He's the subject of all of this. He's the reason I'm out here. He's the reason I was born. The religious leaders kept wanting to make something of John. But John wouldn't, wouldn't have any part of it. He was there to point to Christ and not to himself. Man, we got us a preacher here. Boy, this boy can preach. We need him in our synagogue. Yes, sir. You know what kind of crowds we could get with this? That's the way it works now, too. Yes, sir. If you can learn to perform, that's good enough. There's a whole big difference in crying. Yes, sir. John 3, uh, 25 through 30. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came to John. They came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi. Well, now that's a title of honor. They're calling this guy Rabbi that's got camel hair coat on. and a... <laughs> it kind of makes me sick. <laughs> makes me sick to hear people act like that you know they're just buttering him up they're just talking him up they're just they're laying they're spreading a net for his feet yeah doctor yeah that's the same thing in our day that that is that's repulsive to me job said that i know that if i gave flattering titles to men my maker would soon take me away but modern this generation ain't never heard that the, the top goal in a, in a lot of these guys' lives is not to preach the gospel, but to get that doctor's degree and to get his stationery all prepared where it's doctors on. So I know, I know a couple of preachers that have doctor's degrees that nobody knows it. They don't tell anybody. And they don't put it before their name. 
and they don't want to be addressed that way. There's a, that's a major flaw, mm -hmm. the way I see it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And anyway, they said, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered, and now, you, now remember what we're talking about? A major factor in John's witness is that he put Christ above himself. John didn't exalt himself. If we're going to follow in, if we're going to be a witness, as John was a witness, which is what we're supposed to be, yeah. then, uh, then we, and he was the pattern for a witness, being, bearing witness for Christ, I think. Yeah. I believe that's right. I don't believe you can find a better uh, pattern to go by than him. Well, they, they come out here and said, Rabbi, I mean, you're the one that started this thing. You're the one that was preaching this first. And now this guy you talking about the other day, he's out there preaching and baptizing people. What do you think about that? John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. Yeah. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Yes. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Now see, that's part of the witness. That's part of the effectiveness of our witness, is how little people see us and how much they see Christ. You've all heard the, the little story, whatever, if it's true or whatever, but it surely has happened many times. But one preacher in this meeting got up and preached, and when he sat down, everybody said, Wow, what a preacher! And the next guy that got up and preached, when he sat down, everybody said, What a Lord! Great difference. One bare witness of himself, and the other bore witness of Christ. Every Christian should pay attention to this fact and uh, about the first public witness of Christ in the New Testament. We ought to be aware when giving out our testimony of focusing on ourself instead of Christ. I've heard a lot of testimonies and most of them don't fit this criteria at all. It's about me. It's about myself. Don't, do law sinners need to hear me say that I'm a trophy of His grace? No. <laughs> it just don't sound right in this light, does it? Boy, it makes a good song, though. Makes everybody woozy. But what are they thinking about? And where, where's the focus? Be careful about the tendency to be like the publican and thank God that you're not like other men. And how you're so much better now. Publican, you know... He said, I thank God. And I, he looked up to heaven. I thank God and I'm not like other men. I tithe. I, I'm, boy, I'm at meeting every time. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm not like that old Pharisee. Yeah, I'm right. I'm sorry. I'm not like that old publican sitting there. Don't, don't have your testimony be like that. Don't look at it as how much better you are off you are now and how much better a person you are now. You ought to think more. We ought to think more lowly of ourselves than we ever did. Standing in the light of God, truth, and Christ, we ought to realize how unworthy we are. Instead of bragging about how great we've become, but we're giving all the glory to Christ now. That's you know. <laughs> Don't y'all see? Yes, I mean, yeah. yes, be thankful. He did. Brought, he brought me out of a horrible pit. Yes, he did. And set my feet on a solid rock. And he put a song in my mouth. Yes. But John didn't talk about that, did he? That ain't the way he preached. No. Neither did the apostles. You don't find that in the, in the Bible. You don't find that kind of a testimony. When you find a testimony, a personal testimony in the Bible... Christ is the center of the focus, not me, not the one giving the testimony. He bore, he, I keep saying, he bare witness of him, 
John bear witness of Him. Let's bear witness of Him. Not our self. Watch out talking about anything that puts the focus on yourself rather than Jesus. He's the Savior. He's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Sin of the world. While our witness is null and void without a changed life, that is not the lost sinner's need to be enticed to. See, he doesn't need to be sold on, if you just believe on Jesus, you'll be like me. You can have a new life like me. You can be as good as I am if you'll just trust Christ. That's not, that's not bearing witness. John bear witness. He threw the covers off and said, what are y'all vipers coming out here for? What do you want? What are you thinking? Say, that wasn't nice. He should have welcomed them and asked them for a word and all of No. No. It was, remember the definition? Plain, uncovered. I mean, just made clear. Nobody had done that for him for a long, long time. The Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 58, he opens up with saying, God is saying to the prophet, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and tell the people how much I love them. Is that what it says? No. No, it says, show my people their sin, their transgressions. Make them to understand. But cry. Don't just tell them. Don't just holler at them. I've been in a lot of meetings in 45 more plus years. And I've been in a lot of meetings where I felt like I was just beat up all the whole time that I was there. And somebody just screaming and hollering. There's been preachers that just, there's some of them I can tell you who they are. Now, I won't. But they screech and scream the whole time and say nothing. And it actually gives me a headache. <coughs> hurts my ears. I, I don't get nothing out of it. I've had uh, heard others do all kinds of things, you know, just, well, they broke furniture and jumped over the fence and run out the door and done all kinds of theatrics and what that, what's that word I used before? Uh, uh, what was that word? Anyway, uh, sensationalism there that's what it was but there's just a few times when I've been in a service where the man cried and I don't mean he wept while he was preaching I mean he cried he had a message he had something to tell he believed it that's one thing you know does the preacher believe what he's preaching I've heard preachers preach and they just dance all around everything they won't set their foot down anywhere that woke some of you, up. There you go. <laughs> they don't they're not standing on firm ground in their mind in their heart they're just they don't offend anybody and they just want to include everybody they don't want to be dogmatic about nothing and so they just don't say nothing except this blah 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 mm-hmm. that's a whole lot different than a passionate cry and plea it works it's the witness that is effective. That's right. John the Baptist bear witness like that. Jesus bear witness. He did the same thing. The apostles did the same thing. And that's why they were effective. That's why people listened. All right, I'm hurrying. Do you? Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 32, they don't... They don't need to be enticed to be like me. They can miss God by trying to have what you have. Mm-hmm. I've heard that a lot, you know. Well, I just wanted to have what you have. Well, that may be something that gets your attention, but your atten- there's no good in it if you're trying to be like me or, any- or if you're trying to get somebody to be like you. Yeah. I'm, not the- I'm not the standard. That's right. Christ is the standard. Yes, sir. You gotta, if you're going to get anywhere, you're going to have to have a desire to be like Him. Mm-hmm. Not like some of the best person you know. It's not good to put your trust in men. Not, not even in princes. 
Not even in the best of men. You got to put your trust in Christ. So as we bear witness for Him, let's, let's avoid that snare there. Let's don't lay a snare for a sinner by trying to get Him to, or entice Him to just step up where we are. Be better if He'd step past us on closer to Christ. Jesus said in John twelve thirty two, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. A lot of people say that he's talking about the cross. Well, I believe it is, but there's a deeper truth there than just that. Yes, sir. If you lift up Christ, if he has the preeminence, the work will be done in the souls of men. Right. As long as we can keep ourselves out of the way and just bear witness. John did not get in the way. John did not let John get in the way. John bear witness. And, and although men wanted to put him in the way, men wanted to exalt him, he wouldn't have it. So, witnessing for Christ is not what most professing Christians are doing. They're promoting their religion, their church, their denomination, their movement, but not really promoting the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say that to all. I'm not talking, we got it and they don't. Everybody's in this. Everybody needs to hear this. And we do too. There must be the knowledge of God in the soul that was revealed there by the Spirit of God Himself. We can't bear witness until we have that. We've got to have God's confirmation. In other words, we must be born again before we can bear witness of anything. We, can, uh, we can't cry aloud about something that we've learned from some other men or in a school or from a book somewhere or a movie or a song. We can't cry aloud about that. There must be the true humility that only belongs to those who truly know Christ and have seen themselves in this light, in His light. There has to be a cry in the voice of the witness that causes others to recognize that it's coming from God and not just another man's intellect. That was the thing about John the Baptist. They realized that it was not just this man dressed in camel's hair and eating grasshoppers and wild honey that was that had all this. It was a wonder. When Peter and John and James, I think Peter and John, they marveled that these men were unlearned and ignorant men, yet they had this understanding. Where did they get this? How do they know these things? They even said it, that about the Lord. You know, they, he didn't have letters. He hadn't been to school. He hadn't let them teach him and indoctrinate him and brainwash him into all of their thinking. And yet he knew more than they did. Twelve years old, he was in the temple uh, talking to the doctors. And they were all just like, Wow, how does this twelve-year-old child know this? Well, he was. He was the Word. It's got to be in us from God. So you can come to church, you can listen to me or anybody else you want to preach for a lifetime. And you can know all there is to know, but until God Himself shines into your soul, you don't know anything. Yeah, that's true. And you can't bear witness of it because you just got it from another man or through a book, through whatever. But it was handed to you from somebody else. There's another ingredient that has to be there. The Spirit of God has to be in us. And that comes through the new birth. There, there, there has to be that cry in the voice of the witness that causes others to realize that it's coming from God. And then, one more thing here. In order to convince others to believe in Christ, we got to be able to convince them that we believe in Christ. Yes. <laughs> that's the that's kind of the whole key. Dost thou believe? That's what Jesus said to the disciples. He said, "You believe I can do that?" And they said, "Yeah, we believe." And he said, <laughs> or they said, "Lord, we do believe." And he said, "Oh, you do? Do you? Do you really?" 
He knew that they believed to the best of their ability, but they didn't really believe yet. I mean, is that in your soul? Are you just walking on the edge? Are you, uh, what do you call it, uh, tippy about it all? What you, I mean, does somebody, some atheist or some heathen come along, some gainsayer and, and just mock and make fun of you and ask you questions? Or you just, does that just, does that, what does that do to you? Does that shake you? Once God, once you got God in you and God confirms the truth in you, you, that is a thing that's of the past. Mercy. I'm not intimidated by any of them. The best of them. This, this Dr. Nye, what's his name? or Bill, Bill Nye, the science guy. That guy is about as dumb as a rock. I mean, anybody could listen to him and say... <laughs> Are you afraid? Would you be afraid to talk to him? I don't believe I would. He's blind. And uh, I would hope that there would be something in my witness to him that would shake him, though. Sure would. There's got to be that cry there. John, bear witness and cried. And it made a stir. Everybody knew. Jesus didn't come to town unannounced. He left from there and went to the temple and asked for the scroll. And, you know, John bear witness and he did a good job. I think we ought to study about this and try to do likewise. Witnessing to people is one of the most important things we do while we're still alive on this earth. And we need to do it right. It's always been a thing of concern to me because I don't want to be a bad witness and I don't want to fail at being a witness for Christ. And I sure, I'd rather die right now than, and I mean that, than lead somebody wrong with a witness that's messed up. Too much attention on myself or just wrong ideas I've got about Christ. And teach somebody wrong. Yeah, no, I'd rather die. It's important to me to be a good witness. Not just to be a witness, but to be the kind of witness he was. Yeah. Effective. Don't you want to be an effective witness? Don't you want to see people come to know the Lord because of it instead of just getting them to come to church? You know did all that for so many years and I've known so many that have and they get out there and just, just do everything in the world to get people to come to church and, <clears throat> and then they stop way short of knowing the Lord. Well, I can go on and on. But I'm going to quit. Father, thank you for the truth we've looked at this morning. Please bless it to our minds and hearts and help us to keep this and keep it close to our mind and heart and thoughts and, and the way we practice, the way we Witness to people. Help us, Lord, to have a heart that's on fire for you, that's in love with you above everything else, so that we'd have that passion and that cry in our witness as we deal with other people, not just with our voice, but with our life, that there's more, that we care, that there's more to us than just trying to grow our church or make a name for ourselves, but that we care about the souls of men and women and boys and girls that are dying and going to hell. Please help us, I pray, to be effective for you as long as we are here. And help us in the short time that's left to see some of these lost loved ones saved. In Jesus' name, amen.